everyone. So, normally this week, you would be seeing your regularly scheduled episode of Nintendo Power Perspectives. We are pushing that back a week because E3 2021 has come and gone, and I have notes. So, um, as usual, at the end of each E3, I give my thoughts or my um, picks for best and worst things that were, that were visible to the public over the course of the show. Being that as I, as a person operating out of the Pacific Northwest, and particularly also with having a virtual convention here, I do not necessarily have access to all of the, um, the fun stuff from E3 that like the digital pe subscriber people got attendees got to go to, and certainly members of the press get to go to in terms of closed door stuff when E3 is actually, you know, operational in person. So I get to go over the stuff the rest of us have access to. And the things I liked and things I didn't like. And let's let's get the bad stuff out of the way first. Let's just get it out of our system. And there was some pretty bad stuff this year. A lot of them were basically press conference related, like press conference structure related. Um, for example, the Gearbox press conference that was, um, that was basically just Randy Pitchford going around the back lot of the Borderlands movie and annoying people. Like, the trailers that we saw were trailers that were already at other more high-profile events. Microsoft press conference sort of things. Um, PC gaming show stuff. Um, all that sort of thing. So we'd seen that already. Then these little slices teasing, oh, Borderland, not Borderland, oh, um, ah, oh, crap. Like, oh, like, oh, we have the, the, the other games that, that you like. Um, and we're not, we're not showing those. Uh, Homeworld in particular, oh yes, we have a slice of Homeworld. Um, which is like a small, it's not even like a gameplay thing. It's like a little trivia fact about, about Homeworld. You know, you, you like Homeworld, the, the real-time space sim strategy game. It's fully 3D and all this other stuff. Yeah, we, we're making that, or we, we own the rights to that. That was crap. Um... Speaking of live-action movie stuff, we had a trailer for a movie called Good Guy, starring, um, starring Deadpool, um, in, uh, in the Ubisoft press briefing, um, and, oof, that is also not a good move, uh, like, not a good-looking movie. It could, in fact, actually turn out to be really quite hilarious, um, But yeah, like Ryan Reynolds, all right. I've enjoyed the stuff I've seen him in. But that said, I'm also like a little picky about what movies I see, and the trailer from Good Guy looks bad. In fact, like it, and I want to actually honestly say they probably should have picked that title because the bad review headlines write themselves before the movies even come out, like good guy, comma, or good guy, colon, bad film. A good guy wouldn't take you to see this movie. Um, that sort of thing. Um, for the Devolver Digital Press Conference, the Devolver Press Conferences have this problem which is they have interesting games presented in their press conferences stuck in a really deliberately obnoxious edgelord framework that makes them that makes me less likely to appreciate and enjoy the footage and the, what we're seeing of those games because of the framework around them. Um, if you're a fan of Giant Bomb, you may remember a concept that came up with a few quick looks on that side of, quote, Internet Dan, which is Dan Riker doing a parody or pastiche 
of a particular variety of internet humor that is basically based on the idea that shouting obscenities is funny, um, violence without context is funny, uh, and telling people to do crass things, often usually sexually objectifying things, is inherently funny. Um, he did this in... He created the character in... I forget the quick look, the name of the game. I've blocked the game from my memory. But it was a team-based... It was a, a deathmatch game for the PlayStation 4 with a deliberate drawn in a... Um, like, drawn in, drawn in your high school notebook or middle school notebook kind of aesthetic with the same level of maturity, right? Like, it's very deliberately immature perspective. And that's the thing that Evolver Digital does, what it tends to do with their press conferences. And that's always frustrated me and annoyed me. Like, one of the things, like, the first one of these that they really did, as an example, the thing that they did, it peeves me off, is they, like, part of the thing that they were doing with it is, like, the part of the parody was doing mock cuts to the audience and people reacting in the audience cheerfully to what's happening on stage. And like one of the ones they did was, oh, there was, a, was like a parent with a child in the audience. And the and that one always bugged me. Because the thing is, video games are a artistic medium and artistic mediums are not exclusively meant generally for a particular age range. As an example, I enjoy anime. Anime is an artistic medium. Anime has there are works of Japanese animation of anime that are made for all age demographics. Um and people with all ranges of life experiences. And that's okay. That's in fact that's good. It's wonderful. It it, it speaks to the staying power of artistic medium that there are works of animation for all age brackets instead of just being for children or anime being just for adults and teenagers and that sort of thing. That's great. Same thing with novels. It's good that there are YA novels and middle grade novels. They have merits of their own and they can be just as good and the, as novels aimed for adults. In fact, it's ideally good if they work on multiple levels, particularly if you're dealing with, for example, reading a novel, if you're a parent, reading a novel to your kid. So, having, like, oh, there's a kid in the audience at this, as a, at this game conference where they're showing gory stuff, playing this up as a joke, I'm like, well, video games are for everyone. Now, yes, certainly, having a kid in the audience at the um, id press conference where they're showing off Doom and that sort of thing. Or the, the, but back in the days when it was just strictly Bethesda before Microsoft bought them out. Like, oh, having a kid in the audience at the Bethesda conference where they're seeing Doom and eyeballs getting ripped out of demons' heads and that sort of thing. Like, that's question, like that would be a questionable decision on the parents' part, but like, it that that's the parents' choice. And like, Long story short, it's a long, long rant short. That wand me, rubbed me the wrong way. And after I kind of saw that and I started paying attention to subsequent press, of uh, press briefings at the wrong way, Devolver Digital Conferences, the same sort of thing kept playing up. Like, oh, there's like a degree of punching down gatekeeping humor that keeps just coming in there. Even if like, oh, we're poking fun at micro, like, we're lampooning the game industry's trend of microtransactions and season passes and all this and live service games and all this, that, and the other thing. But the fact that our Devolver games don't have those necessarily. Except they publish Fall Guys, which does. Um, then things get, but then you start going, well, it still puts a like sour note to all of that. Like not in terms of 
souring the perspective of other people's games in, in relation to Devolver, but souring the perspective of Devolver's press conference, uh, Devolver's digital conferences. Because Devolver's games, like, they publish really good games. They've also published some, published some stinkers. I have... I admit I am not like super into the Hotline Miami series, but I've heard people say, oh, there's been a diminishing returns with those. But the point stands is if you feel that what that in order to draw the thing that you have to do to make your games stand out is not the the quality of your games, but to just be so busy skewering the rest of the industry that that lessens your game by comparison because it, it hurt you're not talking about your games you're talking about everybody else and that's the problem other bad stuff um so while the nintendo press briefing was very good it's a very good selection of games and some really good humor for the new um smash reveal of uh, kazuma um from tekken the bad was, oh, like, not quite last minute, because it was technically 10 hours before, but 10 hours before the launch of the briefing is still the uh, middle of the night in, you know, the West Coast, in fairly early morning on the East Coast. I say, oh, Nintendo of Japan, um, we're not going to let people co-stream, and we will take action if people do. After everyone else had gotten clearances to do so, and even Twitch on their official channel was like, we have paperwork. We have an agreement right here. In fact, they posted on the Twitter saying we had, while we, that they pulled out of doing the co-stream saying, while we have an existing agreement with Nintendo saying that we had permission to do this, this crap can't happen out of the blue and we can't, and we can't get this straightened out, basically. And that's, that's crappy on Nintendo of Japan's part. That's undermining Nintendo of America and certainly also Nintendo of Europe's attempts to promote their products and well as any existing brand relationships that they had with part, that they have with partners, be it Twitch, um, and be it various, like the influencers like the completionist who had have gotten permission to, you know, do the co-stream and certainly there was a lot of really good stuff on that show that you've gotten really solid reactions from from again new smash character to metroid freaking five to advance wars one and two remastered collection there were things to love and there are things to love in that press briefing and that left everyone going into it on a sour note the last two are pretty clear cut, no good things. Um, on television, Amico keynote, um, the games look like trash. The console looks really rough. It's not necessarily going to be vaporware in the same way that the Coleco Chameleon was, but it's still really, it, it still feels like a really questionable system. Um, in the sense of, I'm not sure what they're trying to do with it. And the way from they're presenting it, they aren't either. And last but not least, well, I, I would like to say it right, this is my shame of the show, is Mythical Games, with their games, with um, NFT-enabled characters, um, and DLC, and add-ons for characters, along with figures that have NFTs related to them, so... You're not just killing the environment through the through the abuse of the block of blockchain technology, which again could theoretically be used for good things, but this ain't it. But you're also killing the equivalent for cheap plastic crap for live service games that are eventually going to have their servers turned off. <sighs> Blah. But there were good things to be had. Like, starting off right off the bat, we got Metal Slug Tactics. I love the Metal Slug series. I'm not necessarily great at the Metal Slug series, but I love the Metal Slug series a lot. And I like, and particularly I love the visual aesthetic of it, and seeing it applied to a tactics game, which is another genre that's my jam, 
as the time this video goes out, we'll be in the middle of my uh, <laughs> of my Tactics Ogre Let's Play. So yeah, tactic RPGs are my jam. Um, this looks great from what we're seeing, what we've seen of gameplay, and I'm interested in seeing more. And this, like, if this holds up, this is something I'd like to pick up. We had um, Redfall. Um, I'm so used to kind of refreshing myself on this on the fly because it's been a couple days and there was a lot of good stuff this year. Uh, Redfall was right the new multiplayer or single player, depending how you want to do it. So co either single player co-op or single player or co-op shooter from Arcane, the developers of Dishonored and Prey, and that sort of thing. And so I'm interested to see how this turns out. They have already established very well through the Dishonored series and through Prey that they do single-player experiences well, particularly in various varieties of the immersive sim genre. This is doing something kind of different. It does have a lot of like cool powers kind of stuff like what you'd get from Dishonored, but it specifically appears to work or meant to work in a co-op environment, so we'll see how that pans out. Um, little things we got stuff like uh Got, we got a release date for Starfield. Yay. I'm looking forward to seeing more gameplay, but so far, yay, we have a sense when it's coming out. Next 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 year, not surprised by that. COVID's mucked with everything. Uh, Citizen Sleeper looks to be a sort of board gaming inspired role playing game. Um, not in, in the sense of not like how you have like not like Pose of Eternity, um, or similar games where it de does a deliberate infinity engine take on their graphical perspective. This is more like moving dots between nodes and like characters between nodes and that sort of thing. Much more abstracted from what we saw with the gameplay footage, but it looks neat. I dig it. Um, we have um, Tales of Iron, which looks to be either a strategy RPG of some variety, possibly Souls, not Souls-ish, but um, Darkest Dungeon-ish, um, with a semi-furry take. And by semi-furry, I mean like in a red wallish sense. I like games that do that thing, where they're like leaning into the... I mean, I grew up reading the Redwall books, and the Redwall books are very heroic fantasy with some dark elements to them, but aimed to... Chip, but get, it gets handed to kids because it's oh it's 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 fuzzy animals um never mind the fact that like in the first red wall book has a stoat getting run over by a wagon and just getting his backs his like neck snapped and um utterly killed like killed messily uh, but nope the, for kids and like i admit i ate that up when i was younger and i'm looking forward to seeing how the uh, how Tales of Iron, that's T-A-I-L-S of Iron, pans out. Uh, the whole Nintendo press briefing, like, as a whole, again, was great, as I mentioned earlier. The new Smash character looks great. We have um, we have a release date for Shin Megami Tensei 5, along with a few usual game, additional gameplay notes where you see the visual style of it. It looks like a Shin Megami Tensei game. Good. Uh, we have... New gameplay footage of the of uh, Breath of the Wild sequel, not Breath. I'm gonna, I'm calling it, I'm gonna call it Breath of the Wild two for now because we don't really have alternative options. And also, like a lot of really good stuff there. If you haven't sat down and just watched the press conference yet, go sit down and watch it. There is some really good stuff that is worth your attention there, and I'm really looking forward to seeing when that gets picked up or when this stuff comes out. Um, this like going back to this like in Metroid Five, we got. It's great. It's like really good stuff. I am really looking forward to a lot of these games. Other than like, I guess probably the other minor thing of like a minor bad, is some of the presentation stuff from the Square Enix press conference. The Final Fantasy Origins, or like, I should say, the Souls-like adapt readaptation of Final Fantasy One, which is called uh, Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin, clunky title. Um, the presentation of that trailer 
the various how, how it was edited is messy and didn't really get across the gameplay. Well, I got a much better sense of the game and how it plays and its presentation through watching uh, Easy Allies and uh, the general and the crew at Next Lander doing a stream up doing a stream of the demo than I did from the actual gameplay uh, presentation of it during their press briefing. The Guardians of the Galaxy trailer was similarly um, very heavily edited to focus a lot on action sequences and the dialogue clips and some dialogue selection as part of the thing without giving much in like time in between where like so it doesn't give us a sense of how fast is this dialogue going to come out how fast are the quips coming that sort of thing if the quips are just like at the same pace as the trailer i could see it getting old but if it but it could very much not be that you could have moments of, of moments of quiet of ambience and list of where the music of the game can get its to could do its thing you could have non-quippy, snarky dialogue between characters, particularly when you get some like really big scenery shot or that sort of thing. There's room for this game to be good and to have a variety of tones. And the game didn't necessarily present that well. The, uh, the probably other minor bad here, and this is less the Guardians of the Galaxy game, but more the general world we live in with video games, where like Guardians of the Galaxy is a game that I ain't going to be streaming. Even if I buy it, I ain't going to be streaming it because there's a game mechanic in the game that is basically Star-Lord's headphones and his and the various awesome mix tapes in the terms of licensed music that plays and gives a power up to the party. And like one of the example piece they have in the trailer is or the gameplay demo is with bad reputation by the runaway. So it's licensed real real world music. And, um, so yeah, that's licensed music as a game mechanic, which I'm not necessarily cleared to have on my stream or my YouTube channel. And, um, uh, when it comes to like, so like when you play it, so when you play the game in, um, streamer mode, like, does it play royalty free music there? Uh, does it play lockdown when you start when Star Lord gets his big power up, or is this like no, you can't really do a royalty, a, a streamer friendly mode for this, or are like if, if you if you're streaming this game, you just can't use this gameplay mechanic at all, and if that's the case, that's crappy. But that's not crappy for on Square Enix's end, I will say that's crappy. That's crappy on Twitch's end. That's crappy on. YouTube's end. I would say it's crappy on Facebook's end, but they handed over a bunch of money to record labels to basically cut them some, to get the record labels to cut them some slack on VODs. But even then, VODs on you on Facebook do not last as long as VODs on YouTube, which basically where there, my edited Let's Plays stay out last as long as YouTube on YouTube, more or less as long as I want them to provided no outside action is taken to take them down. So yeah, that's messy looking at this from the perspective of a person who puts, puts videos on YouTube. So, with all that out of the way, I enjoyed the, the, the coverage that I saw of this year's E3. There's a lot of games coming out of this that I'm looking forward to their release, and I hope, and some of them I hopefully will be able to cover. And I hope that you found some stuff as well. If there's anything that I didn't mention that you want to bring up, please post in the comments below. I'm interested. Like, if there's something I missed, I am interested to hear about it because there's there's like a, there were a lot of co streams going on, a lot of demos coming out, and again, I didn't do the paid thing, so there are probably so maybe some additional E3 stuff that I didn't get a chance to see that maybe y'all did, and that'd be cool if, uh, if you let me know about it. Next week, and we get to our slightly delayed next episode of Nintendo Powered Retrospectives.
Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 